Hello, welcome. Nice to have everybody here on a Wednesday night. Uh, can you hear okay? Okay, so a couple things. First of all, at Orthodox Synagogue, we don't usually use microphones because during the Sabbath, we don't use much electricity. So this is new for us. That's number one. And number two, we don't have a Wednesday night church culture, so this is very special for us to be coming together. I want to welcome our friends from Church of Christ across the street, some old friends that I've known for a long time, and some new friends. And of course, to your new interim uh, pastor, John York, who's over there, you want to raise your hand? Welcome to you. And uh, thank you for being here. Also to John Hill. Where's John? John from Glenmore United Methodist, wonderful to have you. We have such great neighbors in this little area that Leslie Larson is calling Weibo, is that right? <laughs> West End and Bowling Weibo. And we hope that we can do more things together. There's a lot I'd love to say, but tonight is not about me, it's not about our synagogue, it's not even about our church, it's about much, much more. We're really fortunate to have uh, Jay Geller in Vanderbilt with us, Shatika in the back, thank you for putting this together with us. This is a real treat. Jay is really, thank you. Jay is the associate professor of modern Jewish thought at Vanderbilt Community School. You can hone in very specifically in the Holocaust, and when you kind of broaden out, you see he's an expert in so many different areas, and film, and culture, and all different kinds of things. So the next four weeks, the next three, four weeks, are going to be a real um, experience for all of us. Uh, my personal hope is that we all get to know each other uh, for the next few weeks and that we can do more together, that we can really hone in on the Holocaust when it started and all the facts and figures, and um, that we can build community together. So, uh, quick housekeeping. There's bathrooms down the hall that way. If there are full, there's more bathrooms downstairs. Next week, we're going to meet over... that direction? No, in that direction. Next week, we'll be in that direction. Following in that direction. Last speak right back here. So again, thank you for coming. And without further ado, it's my honor and pleasure to present Jay Geller. Okay, does it work? Is this working? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, there's a road map on the tables. Um, if you don't have one, Yeah, there's still a few left, so whoever. OK, because what this is, is that, uh, you know, of course, I'm asking you to bring these, this home with you and bring it back next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. And since, in other words, we'll print more, so if you forget it, you'll get another one. And if you do not have a copy, uh, we do have, if we run out of the copies, which will have the roadmap for all four nights, then we also have a sheet with just for tonight, which Shatika and Sonia have over there. Now, um, so what this does is, uh, what, uh, so you, you can see it, it also provides you space to write notes if that's what you want to do. Uh, but also since I'm sure that not everybody has you know, 20, 23 vision, to be able to read this, uh, the roadmap will help you. So uh, when I say it, it will it'll be there in front of you. Um, and so, and I will be moving around from station to station to station. Okay? Um, but first of all, let me thank all of you. I'm really shocked at the vast numbers of people who are here. I thought you'd all be where I would be if I had my druthers, which would be watching uh, the Yankees on Fox Sports 1. <laughs> Last I looked, they were up 4 nothing, So that, that takes an incredible load off of me. Um, what? They tied the series. Oh, yeah, but now they're, they're about to go ahead. Oh, well. Anyway, I could spend the next hour talking about the Yankees, but I, I'm not sure that's why you came, although some would actually probably consider that to be, uh, if, if not the Holocaust, then the bonfire of the vanities. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I have been 
teaching virtually every fall since my wife, A.J. Levine, and I came to Vanderbilt in 1994, a course called The Holocaust, Its Meanings and Implications. Um, although I must admit that religious studies, which originally did it, always left off the S. <laughs> They're really into meaning and not meanings, but we're going to be dealing with plurals here. And this course is made up of a mix of undergrads, divinity students, graduate students, members of the community on occasion. And all of these individuals each comes to the class with a certain notion of what the Holocaust refers to. You know, the who, what, where, or when. But what most share, what is their overriding concern, is that other W, which is why. And it's that why question that echoes this exchange between Primo Levi and a German guard in Auschwitz. Uh, and that's actually the, on, the, on your front page, it's the first quote, but I'll read it out loud. Warum? Why, I asked him in my poor German. Here is kein warum. There is no why here, he replied, pushing me inside with a shove. For many of you, I'm sure, this is your, also your concern, this question of why. And I hope that you will not be disappointed to discover that after our four evenings together, I will not be providing the answer. But the title of the series, Promises, Meanings, and Implications. Yet before we can speak about meanings and implications of an event, we have to come to some shared sense of what event or series of events we, wish to, we seek to speak about. The attempted destruction of European Jewry has been subsumed under a number of different names. Do these designations all refer to the same event? Tonight, we will look into some of these names, how they are employed, and discuss what they refer to what they refer. On the following two Wednesdays, we will explore how the date we assign to the beginning of an event, when we think an event has begun, also conveys a sense of what that, me that event is about. So during those two weeks, those two nights, we will travel from the fifth century before the Common Era to January 20th, 1942. And just as when an event is said to begin says something about an event, so does when the event ends. So in our last gathering, we will discuss how the dates that we assign for the end of this event, what that says about the event. And then we'll also deal with numbers, because the numbers associated with these events also have different meanings, different associations. So we will explore these. But today, we begin our discussion of the Holocaust. And as I said, and as you can see around us, the event or series of events has been given a variety of different names. Do they all refer to the same thing? Do they all smell the same? My last name is Geller. My wife's name is Levine. We're at dinner. Telephone rings as a solicitor. He asks for Mr. Levine. Is he home? So let's say actually it's 1938. You're a male Jew by the name of, oh, Joseph Schmidt, or a female Jew by the name of Brunhilde Schwartz, 
a law was decreed that required every Jew who did not have a name that was self-evidently Jewish, if you were a man, to bear the middle name Israel, and if you were a woman, to bear the middle name Sarah. If you have visited either the U U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum or Auschwitz or seen films and you've seen all of these valises, you may have wondered why so many people have a middle name of Sarah and of Israel. This is why. So what is a name? What do they do? Names give events meanings and sometimes they obscure the reference. Names can code events and they can commemorate them. Names are both descriptions and they are acts of interpretation. So let's explore a few of the names to which these events have been given. The first name is the Endlösung der Judenfrage. What is that? What, do you, what can you tell just by seeing this? What, can you, what do you assume about this by seeing this? German. It's German, right. See an umlaut, German. Okay. It means the final solution of the Jewish question, of the Jewish problem. Okay. Now, the Jewish question did not originate with the National Socialists. In the 19th century, the whoever was in charge would talk about the demands of the other groups who wanted perhaps a piece of the action. They were a problem. So you had the Jewish problem, you had the women problem, you had the social problem, which was about class. You had the nation's problem in Austria, which was about the various ethnic groups. So this language of problem to describe groups pre-existed the Nazis. But let's think about this, solution and problem. If you have a problem, what do you do? What do you want to do with a problem? Solve it. Okay. Is there any kind of ethical decision seems to be there? Kind of seems like sort of engineering, you know. Something's broken, you want to fix it. Where's the, where's the ethics here? It's just simply a matter of getting something done. The final solution of the Jewish question emerged as the National Socialists, as the Germans were seeking to find some way of dealing with initially removing the influence of the Jews, then removing the Jews from the territory of Germany. And so they talked about the territorial solution of pushing them out of Germany. And they began talking about a total solution. And in the summer of 1941, they began talking about a possible uh, end solution, final solution. Eichmann talks about it there. And then in January 20th, 1942, Reinhold Heydrich gathered together not the major officers, but getting heads, secretaries, assistants of, the, of major departments in government, in the party, and in industry to agree to participate under Heydrich's lead in what was to become the final solution of the Jewish question. It wasn't a matter of pushing Jews out. It wasn't a matter of ethnic cleansing. It was about the complete elimination of European Jewry. You don't see murder here. You don't see people here. This is a euphemism. Who would see murder beneath 
the notion of a solution, a final solution of a, of a problem. Nevertheless, even though it was not directly referring to this killing, it was considered a secret phrase only limited to memos within the inner circles of various uh, uh, organizations, departments of the, uh, of the Third Reich. But by 1943, even th there, the euphemism was gone completely. And so it was forbidden to even refer to these events as the final solution. Because by 1943, everybody knew what the final solution meant. And so I just want to leave with this question. What does it mean for us to describe these events employing the term that the perpetrators, that the killers used. So, here. Die Judenvernichtung. What do you know, notice about this? I know there's no umlaut, but it's again, it's German. Okay. It means the destruction or the extermination of the Jews. And this was, after the fall of the Third Reich, a preferred German term. Okay? It's an interesting term because Vernichtung, extermination, is not a term you normally use for people. You murder people, umbring and murder. You, what gets vernichtet are vermin, buildings, objects, pests. Those are what is vernichtet. That's what's destroyed. So even in this, even in describing this event, it's preserving the sense of the Jews as something other than human. And so the death camps, the vernichtungslager, they were not referred to that by, during uh, when the Germans were, they were all KZs, concentration camps. It, the notion of a Vernichtungslager, an extermination camp, or a Todeslager, a death camp, emerged during the, war, the trials of the war criminals afterward, when the Allies were trying to describe and distinguish between what those camps devoted to murder versus concentration camps, which had been there for political prisoners and all sorts of other folks. Okay? So that's the Judenvernichtung. Okay. Next, la deportation. What? French. Okay, what does it seem like it is? Deportation, the deportation. What is a deportation? What do you do with a deportation? So who do you send away? Undesirables, okay, but could you deport an American citizen? A naturalized born American citizen? Shouldn't be able to. Yeah, I know. The rules may change soon. <laughs> they may change soon. Although, again, um, back in uh, the 1930s in California, they deported born uh, uh, Chicanos and Chicanos, and it took them 20 years to get back. But California aside, which is also kind of how things are viewed now, um, deportations are usually of illegal aliens, people who are not legally on this. And then when you remove them, they're no longer your business. You have no responsibility. They're the ones who are the criminals. You are merely following law. Now, in France, la deportation refers not only to the removal of the Jews, whether they were Jews who were born in France or Jews who had sought France as a refuge as they were escaping Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and other places. It also included all of the French who were conscripted by the Germans to work in their industries and their farms as forced labor, and it also referred to 
all of the French resistance fighters who were rounded up in night and fog and taken to concentration camps. So when they refer to the deportees, it was all of these individuals. So the very specificity and the distinction of, of how the Jews were deported is screened out. Moreover, since it is a deportation, the sense of the responsibility of France for the deportation is also obscured. And indeed, until 1996, when Jacques Chirac finally acknowledged that Vichy France was false. So even if they would accept some sort of responsibility, it wasn't France that did it, it was Vichy. Okay? So that's la deportation. Okay. What is this word? Hashoah. The Shoah. What do you recognize about this? What? Hebrew. Okay. Now, Hashoah, well, or Shoah is actually, the word appears in Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible, in Psalms, Ezekiel, and it means catastrophe, disaster. And in modern Hebrew, the word Shoah, not without, without the direct article, without the, the Shoah, just means your regular disaster, uh, whether a natural disaster or a human disaster, a nuclear disaster would be a Shoah. But HaShoah, the Shoah, refers to only one very specific event, and that is what happened to the destruction of European Jewry. And this was chosen by Yad Vashem, which was the Martyrs and Heroes Authority in 1955. This is the official uh, Israeli organization to deal with the memory, the knowledge, uh, the commemoration, the gathering of research of the Shoah. Um, but it's a very interesting term. When Shoah appears in the Hebrew Bible, what it talks about is there's, you know, there they go again, the Jews transgress the covenant, and there's a disaster, there's a catastrophe, but after every Shoah, there's an eventual reconciliation, a reworking of the covenant with the deity. Now, Every spring, Jewish communities around the world, I mean, this is amazing, it's the only time you, well, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe except for tonight, where you'll get, uh, I'm being generous to myself, uh, <laughs> the Orthodox, the Reconstructionists, the Conservative, and the Reform all together in one service for Yom HaShoah, okay? It's actually not just Yom HaShoah, it's Yom HaShoah Vehagevurah, the day of the martyrs, the day of the catastrophe, and the heroes. In other words, the victimization of the Jewish people has to be balanced out with their active resistance. They weren't, and moreover, with this notion of this, rather than depending upon the deity for redeeming the people. The responsibility now is on the Jewish community. So that is Yom HaShoah. So it's caught up in this dynamic. Uh, at this point, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Cherban, 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 Cherban. What language? Any other language? Yiddish. Okay. Cherban, Yiddish, Cherban. Cherban also has a long tradition in Judaism. 
the destruction of the first temple, it's called the first Choban. Destruction. The destruction of the second temple is the second Choban. A Choban means the destruction of that site where the deity and the Jewish community and meet, Jerusalem and the temple. But after the second Chaban, after the destruction of the second temple, that connection became the holy community itself. Hence, what would happen is if you made, during the Crusades, at the onset of the First Crusade, there were a series of massacres throughout Europe as the Crusaders were making their way to Palestine. And they would write these martyrologies, these accounts of, of these destroyed towns and of the people and how they, of these martyrs. And also of those resistors who were there as well. And for the Jewish calendar, right, this is 5778, but in the martyrologies, they would use a, an additional periodization. So when uh, Mainz was destroyed in 1096, the martyrologies would say um, 1026 AH, 1026 years after the Chaban. Okay, so these uh, uh, violence performed against the Jewish people were tied to this. And in response to what was happening to European Jewry, they began talking about the third Chaban, der dritte Chaban. That this, what happened to European Jewry, was that kind of disaster, that destruction of that holy community, that bond between God. And yet, just as after the first Chaban and the second Chaban, the community persisted and remained. Now, for varieties of reasons, and Chaban was being used fairly extensively in the 40s, but in Israel, there's a great deal of resistance to it for two reasons. One, Yiddish. Two, if there's a third Chaban, that may means there can be a fourth Chaban or a fifth Chaban. And also, it's defining the Jewish community in terms of its sorrows, in terms of what had, their victimization, in terms of the violence that had been committed against them. And this was not in Israel's desire, nor should it be in anyone's desire. But this was why Chaban was resisted and HaShoah came to the fore. Questions? Okay. Now that's going to be a neat trick. <laughs> Auschwitz. Why would Auschwitz become a name for these events? What was Auschwitz? Concentration camp, what else? A death camp, what else? A labor camp. It was all the different forms. There, as, there were satellite camps. It was a variety of all the kinds of camps converge on this. It was the site where the most 1.4 million people were murdered in Auschwitz, of which 90%, almost 1.1 million, were Jews. It was the by combining all these aspects of the camps, it seemed to combine the worst of systematic killing and dehumanization of the individuals. They would refer to it as the anus mundi, the asshole of the world, the anus of the world. And hence, this systematic murder and this dehumanization seemed to be what rendered this event so specific, so demanding of engagement, what made this different than all others events in the world. And so Auschwitz seemed to embody that, a synecdoche, seemed to capture this. And so Auschwitz 
became very powerful. You may have heard, you know, there can be no poetry after Auschwitz. There are these phrases where Auschwitz becomes for the term. Now, Auschwitz, if you were an American in the 40s or 50s or 60s, Auschwitz wouldn't quite mean the same thing. For Americans, if you thought death camp, it was Dachau and Buchenwald. Why? Because that, those are the camps we liberated. They were the end stations of the death marches, but they were not death camps. But once the word of death camp comes out and the experience and the images we had of Dachau in, uh, in particular, they became for the Americans the notion of a death camp. For the British, it was Bergen-Belsen. Auschwitz was in Poland, and Poland was in the Eastern Bloc, and in the midst of the Cold War, it's kind of, and Auschwitz had been liberated by the Soviets. And so the notion of having communist Russia and liberation together just didn't make its way into American minds. It just didn't fit. So Auschwitz was brushed aside initially. In other words, it was recognized, it was a fact, but for Americans, it was Dachau. For, German, for English, it was Bergen-Belsen. So, so Auschwitz became the figure for what was very specific and most horrible, definitive about what had been done during these events. Now, these are very, these other three over here very, go through very quickly. Hitler's site, again German, the era of Hitler. Okay, it was done during the Hitler site. What does that mean? Who did it? Not the Germans. It was Hitler's fault. He's a madman. Can't happen again. No more Hitlers. Disappear. I'm not gonna, you know, this is not up for debate. <laughs> well, it is up for debate, but not here. Okay? So Hitler's sight was a way of describing this. Um, very, very brief anecdote. When I first went to Germany, I went to a town in Passau. It's in southwestern uh, Germany. Uh, it was a very brown city, very national socialist. Uh, for some reason, the good burgers of Passau thought I was Jewish. Um, and when they'd meet me, the first thing they'd say, Hitler war Österreicher. Hitler was an Austrian. <laughs> anyway, OK, so World War II. Why do I put it up there? OK, those of you who went to uh, high school when I went to high school and those who went before me and maybe even a few after me, do you recall in your American history books, your world history books, any reference to the destruction of European Jewry? OK, so maybe a sidebar. OK, well, this is World War II. It's war. Horrible things happen. Atrocities take place. That's what happens in war. So when you talk about this as World War II, the destruction of European Jewry just kind of gets covered over, and all we remember is the good war that we won and how bad they were. But the specifics of that occluded. In response to that, and also in response to sort of the emphasis on the killing machine, with a notion like the final solution. Uh, Lucy Davidovitz, uh, historian, a, a, a leader in YIVO, said, well, there were two wars going on. You had World War II against the Allies, and you had the war against the Jews. <coughs> and wanted to give it the sort of weight that many people would have for the notion of war to describe what was going on, and to recognize that this was a very much, uh, for the Vitavis, a very much an intentional act. They were opposing an enemy and they were going to vernichte it. They were going to exterminate that enemy. Now, as he makes his way. Yeah. <laughs> Poramos. Now, uh, I, I think you get an extra roll if you can figure out what language this is, <laughs> or an extra cookie. <laughs> it's ro it's uh, from a di uh, Romani dialect, the Romancenti gypsies. 
this uh, term is, was, began to emerge as a term in non-Roma discussions of what the, what the Roma and Cindy had been put forward to. Uh, a a Romani uh, historian by the name of Ian Hancock, a, 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 Holocaust, a genocide expert, uh, drew upon this from one particular dialect. It means uh, devouring or destruction. Uh, because the Roma people were, were, remained marginalized in European society after the end of the Third Reich, remained objects of persecution. Moreover, were largely not, not illiterate, but non-literate. They didn't have publishing houses. There was no way of describing this. And because they were Roma or because they were gypsies, there wasn't a concern. And besides, they probably deserved it anyway. Not, not killing, but you know. Uh, so paramos has become a term, and I put it up here, even though it doesn't have a specific relationship to the destruction of European Jewry, because once claims were being made and asking for recognition to, of what the Roma and Sinti people had been put through, then all of a sudden it became questions of, well, it's not like what the Jews went through, or it is like what the Jews went through. So it became part of the kind of discourse about what exactly happened, what was going on with, with the destruction of the, Euro, of the European Jewry, as well as the destruction of the Romani and Sinti, as well as the uh, euthanasia of the, of the handicapped, the starvation to death of the Russian prisoners of war. It began to recognize not that they were all the same event, but that when we talk about what happened to these other groups, we need to make sure we do not forget about the other groups and recognize this. This is not a game of one downsmanship. Uh, discriminating against somebody is an evil. You don't have to kill them to be engaged in an evil act. So it's not about numbers. We're just talking about persecution, killing, and dehumanizing. So that's why I have Paramos here. OK, questions? Oh, I, oh, one other thing very quickly, which is that not all Roma and Sinti people accept this term, and I'll explain why. Because in a number of Romani um, dialects, it's also the word for violation and rape. And hence, it's a word that is so, for them, so immoral to, in a sense, it's saying they've been subjected to this. And so they want to distance themselves from that. But like everything, unless you have a name of something, to hold, to hang on to. It's very hard to talk about something, which brings us to the next term, genocide. OK, what's a side? Killing, Killing right. Homicide, parricide. OK, how about, what's a genos? People. The murder of a people. It's a very interesting term because it has a Greek, part Greek, part Latin. OK, to basically talk about this as not just specific to any one people, but to emerge. And it's a word that had to be created. Why did it have to be created? Rafia Lemkin was a Polish Jewish refugee lawyer. By 1943, it was known, A, the Allies were going to win. B, that after the war, there were going to be trials of the Germans. When you have a trial, when you have, you cannot put somebody on trial if there's no crime on the law, on the books for which they can be tried. And what was happening to European Jewry was not something that was there on the books. Lemkin drew upon the experience of the Armenians in Turkey 
in the gen what he would term the genocide of 1915, 16, 17. That experience, the Armenians for whom Adolf Hitler is reputed to have said in 1938, either to the ambassador of England or to a reporter who remembers the Armenians. If you cannot recognize, have this as a recognized crime, who will remember the Jews? And so he helped to give this term so that they would be able to de develop international law rendering these crimes against groups as punishable. And by 1948, the United Nations had a protocol on the uh, prevention and punishment for genocide, which the United States agreed to and I guess, what was it, December 1988, that uh, we finally signed with a few consuls. But genocide became a way of understanding this event. Now, there were concerns about this event because there's no, uh, what does it mean? Because the language is uh, in whole or in part. What does it mean to be in part? destroyed for a group of people, the intention to destroy a people in whole or in part. And what exactly is the destruction of a people? Is there culture, is cultural genocide? Can there be cultural genocide? If you rob a people of their language so that there's no way for them to have a community where they can have these language which has a shared history, is that a form of genocide? When you require Native American children to go to reservation schools and are forbidden to speak their languages so that they will be thoroughly integrated. Is that a form of genocide? Again, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just, these are questions that are being raised by this. Okay, it opens up that. But one of the other concerns is, okay, then how can one, what makes any particular genocide special? It becomes almost a common term. So there's some concerns about that, uh, which allows saying, well, my genocide is bigger than your genocide. And so when you have a term like genocide, there is that concern that it will open up comparison, where comparison is, 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 is an obscene thing. You know, you cannot compare horror with horror. Horror is horror. Evil is evil. Murder is murder. So, and genocide now has a different sort of effect because since it is now law, if you utter the phrase genocide, then there seems to be a responsibility to act. You may have heard about the uh, memorandum written in the State Department in 1994 forbidding the use of the G word in all Department of State memoranda for if the Department of State was to refer to Rwanda and use the G word, then while there was no absolute legal requirement for the US to intervene, there would be this kind of moral necessity. So the G word was banned. And 10 years later, President Clinton apologized. Okay, last term. Here's a term you'll recognize, you came here. It derives from the Greek holocaustos, which is in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, of the Tanakh. It's the translation of Ola, whole burnt offering. And so when one talks about Holocaust and being aware of this tie to a whole burnt offering, there's sort of Queasiness. But before we even think about it as a religious term, because English speakers would have only encountered, not the Greek, 
unless they happen to be uh, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints who will bring out their, their, their Greek and uh, when they're knocking at your door. But this form of whole burnt offering using the word Holocaust does not appear in the King James Bible. It only appears once in the Catholic Douay Bible. And there, this whole burnt offering is to an idol, to false gods. But why Holocaust? Well, some of the explanations are that English speakers needed a word that really had no sort of firm sedimentation, any firm foundation in any other usage. The word Holocaust did show up. If you look at the Great Gatsby, it's in the Great Gatsby. And when Gatsby gets killed and what, Ben, what's his name? You know, it's referred to as a massacre. It's in Absalom, Absalom. You know, where Faulkner has one of his characters referred to the Civil War as a Holocaust. It showed up in the, for the French talked about the trench warfare of uh, World War I as a Holocaust. This is not capital H, this is the language. You could look in newspapers in the 30s and 40s when there would be a, a building burnt down using a language of Holocaust, but it not secured its way into a, any particular proper usage. It does show up in the English translation of the uh, forward, the, the front material for, the, for Israel's Declaration of Independence. It's not the translation of Shoah. It's not the translation of Chaban. It's the translation of the word Tevach, massacre, slaughter. And in there, it refers to the uh, Nazi slaughter of European Jewry. But in 1948, whoever was translating chose the word Holocaust. Um, it began to circulate. I think that a, a major force in rendering a Holocaust so important was Elie Wiesel's night. Not Wiesel's text. Francois Mauriac's introduction makes reference when he's talking about Wiesel about and, and, as, and the Jewish Holocaust. And so here in Wiesel's work, not Wiesel, but his, the book that was circulating, Holocaust begins to emerge. And you begin seeing it increasingly, but it didn't initially capture the attention because those of us who were around in the 50s and 60s might recall another usage of the word Holocaust that was far more frequent, nuclear Holocaust. And if you look, they've done, they've done uh, data searches, look in terms of comparing the usage of nuclear Holocaust versus Holocaust referring to the destruction of European Jewry. And around the late 60s, there's a shift. But up until that point, far more usage of Holocaust tied in with the nuclear destruction of humanity. But then, in 1968, a major event took place. You may not think this was major, but really it's a class. An academic, I know it's major. In the Library of Congress, under subject headings, Holocaust, comma, Jewish, parentheses, 1939-1945. So in 1968, the Library of Congress recognized the Jewish Holocaust as, as a significant event worthy of indexing under its own force. So Holocaust has become, although now Shoah, especially among Jewish communities, Shoah probably is used even much more frequently. But if I was to offer a course at Vanderbilt on the Shoah or the Choban or have a forbid the Poramos, no one would have any, most people would have no idea what I'm talking about. Holocaust is a way 
and to use it not, not to think of it necessarily as describing the event, but it's a way where one can start talking about the event. Because we need to have we need to have something to hang on to so that we can share. And if the conversation around our discussion of the Holocaust allows us to recognize that it's not limited to any notion of perhaps sacrifice or of uniqueness or what have you. Or, and it will allow us to think of questions, does the Holocaust only refer to the Jews? And if it does, or if it's specific to the Jews, then the kinds of encounters that we have when groups like PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment uh, uh, of Animals, had this publicity campaign in the early noughts, a Holocaust on your plate where they had these giant panels where they would juxtapose images from concentration camps or from Auschwitz, from death camps with, industri with, with industrial farming. Or the kinds of other employees of Holocaust, whether to describe um, uh, what the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere experience, or the, uh, the Africans in the Middle Passage, or in slavery, uh, or because Holocaust has achieved this kind of sense of, of you know, the horror of the horror, and a way of, okay, if you can describe your, what happened to you as a Holocaust, or as the other Holocaust, or the forgotten Holocaust, or the American Holocaust, then all of a sudden you're trying, you're hoping that people will recognize, look at what happened. And so therefore you'll have various communities, the Jewish community in particular will get very upset about how this, this term seems to have been appropriated, expropriated from them. Or when one uses Holocaust as this kind of ready analogy, just like using Hitler as a ready analogy, oh, it's gonna be another Holocaust. And so there are concerns about that. Um, so, but for the, case, for the sake of our evenings together, we'll go with the events. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Feel free, no, no, there, there's, think about all of these different names. There's no one right name. Each one of these names describe and call attention to one aspect of, of what happened during this. There's not a wrong name here. There's not a right name. What is a recognition is that people in different positions, in different places, in different times, in different countries, in different languages, perceive the event differently. From a French perspective, a German perspective, Hebrew, Israeli, Yiddish, American, academic, human rights perspective. All of these are, are ways of trying to come to grips with an event. And it's a way also for us to just keep on thinking through these events. So we have time uh, for questions. Yes. I was thinking about David when he talks about Hank's oh, heart. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about David when he said uh, they required of us a song and we hung our harps on the willow tree. And I was thinking about Dresden where it wasn't, didn't they require them to play music with the art? And I was thinking about why is that um, the last butterfly so in court? You know, the, 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 there's a poem that talks about that. About Trace and Stone. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we don't hear a lot about Dresden, but... Uh. Unless you're in Germany. Yeah. Um, but... American or British war crimes um, have their place. You heard about Dresden actually in the defense of, of, of uh, Göring in Nuremberg. It's trying to say, you too, you too have committed these war crimes. 
Again, this is a question, it's, it's a question of comparing. Dresden has its place in its discussion. To talk about the Holocaust, to talk about any of these events does not preclude the discussion. It's not saying Dresden didn't take place. Oh, yes. No, but, but, yes. but that's what I want to emphasize. It's not a matter of, well, what about Dresden? Well, yes, but that's something else. It doesn't change this event either. And a recognition of this, of, of the bombing policy, especially the last year of the war, yes, that's indeed a topic, but it's a, 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 a different category. So again, this again, this is a, another case of here was a, a horrible war crime, and that's you don't deny it, but you don't preclude. You, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that okay. Okay, well, by talking about this, you're forgetting the snow. Talking about this, we're talking about this. Wasn't Dresden the one that they would bring, like the uh, Red Cross and stuff, to to say, "Hey, look, things are bad." Oh, oh no, oh, oh, that, oh, have I, have I got oh, the wrong you got it wrong. Thing? That's why you have okay. that's why you have the last butterfly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's Terezin, That's Theresienstadt, okay. okay. which was um, which was initially to be the ghetto for the Jews of Prague. It then became so-called a model ghetto, okay. which was used in a remarkable ad campaign for the wealthier and uh, more um, elite groups, especially in Western Europe, saying, listen, give us all your money right now. Don't hide it. And if you do it, we'll give you uh, a, a train trip to lovely Terezin, where you will have you know, the model ghetto, the, the, the city that the Fuhrer built for the Jews. And that was um, to mix, mix uh, uh, authoritarianisms or, uh, or tyrannies uh, of a Temkin village. Can you spell that for me? Theresienstadt, T H E R E S I E N S T A D T. And it's, you know, it's, if you ever go to Prague, it's about an hour's drive outside. No matter what we call it, can we bring it to an end? I, I hate to say, well, you know, stick with us the next three weeks. Uh, <laughs> um, but we still, still have to think about when did it begin. Yeah, that's my question. Nice segue. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and again, also, it's a question of bring what to an end? which is why the theme for my next lecture is the second quote that's attributed to Mark Twain, although whether he said it or not, it, they're not sure. <laughs> History does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so what, to, an, to answer your question, given that, if you're looking for the same thing that happened, what we'll be describing we may will miss the rhyme. And so what this kind of study does hopefully do is get us to attend to all of these little things that might be taking place and also recognize is that uh, it doesn't matter whether or not the gas chamber is the end point or whether merely uh, marginalizing them from society, rendering them poor and in, in bad health is insufficiently bad. I mean, this is the argument you hear. Well, you know, we're not talking about killing them. And so to, rec to be aware of those little steps, the increments that take place. Because what happened in Germany was a step by step by step by step, little increments, and each, and each time you cross another step, especially as time lapses, you're not even aware that you've crossed steps. And as people get separated out, you know, it's like, you know, celebrity uh, big brother, where are they now? But I mean, you really think of the whole, I mean, I think of uh, the book of Esther, where, I mean, this spirit has been around up, up to murder the Jews for, 
Well, we'll, 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 deal, we'll deal with that. That's okay. why. That's why we're going to say when. When does the the event begin? Feel free to sit right afterwards for a few questions. Oh yeah. Okay, great. So thank you so much for tonight. We're, we're going to be back next week, and Jay will stick around for a few minutes to answer people's questions. So thank you. So thank you so much.